Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Justin Ford. He's going to talk to us about uh, the importance of storytelling. Actually, uh, Harry Potter got my attention. I think more of us are here. Oh, let's see what's talking about, but also about uh, community and about open source. Uh, please, please, a round of applause for Justin. Thank you.
for the users. It's a very, it's kind of an easy way of describing how we're telling the story. Because we're trying to target the Python community and show them why Fedora is great for developing with Python and why it targets their needs and why it's a great distribution for developing with Python. But for our contributors, it was a really unique success story because we had, uh, when we started this, the idea started in the marketing and the community operations. And the idea about how we wanted to proceed with this went forward, and then we reached out to the Python SIG about what they thought would be something that we would want to highlight for uh, promoting Python in Fedora. And it wasn't just like a, we're going to ask these questions and get an answer, and, and then we're going to work on this idea more. It was a very constant communication. It was very active. It wasn't like we were going back and forth. The Python community in Fedora was an active part of this. And then, once we had the ideas, we went to the design team to work on things like a brochure and, and like the design by like t-shirts and stickers. And even for that process, we had Python developers and a marketing team that were very active and engaged in the entire process. So it wasn't just like the design team is doing their thing, the marketing team is doing their thing, and the Python community will ask them what we need to. It was a very active and engaging process for all of the different groups. And the reason why that was successful was because communication for the entire process was very open and transparent. When we started the process in marketing, we immediately reached out and tried to involve and engage the Python community about this entire uh, this campaign and trying to get their input on it. It wasn't like we surprised them with it and like, hey, we're going to do this and want your input. It was, this is an idea that we want to work together on. We want to find the best solution so we can better promote this what our project is doing well and how we can share that with our users. So in that way, storytelling is very important for your users to know maybe why they want to use your software, but also your contributors, so they know what's happening in different parts of your community. So how do you tell this open source story in your own communities? And the, the simple way of saying it is there's a, using the best practices and using certain tools can help better extract the story and improve visibility of various parts of your project community. And fair warning, if you're looking for some kind of like secret tool or underground method that's going to solve all of the, the needs for your project to make your contributor community thrive and, and do better, there's no secret. There's no big secret tool or method. But rather, it's using the things you already have to their maximum potential. And just as a set of ideas, I have a few examples that are ordered from least frequent that you want to use to the most frequent, but it's not a measure of importance. So firstly, the README or project overview, depending on your project size, is the front door and the first impression you make on potential users and contributors. And it's the first everything for anyone that comes into your project ever. If they want to know about what your project is, if it's a smaller project on GitHub, they'll go to your README. And they'll try to see what the objective that you're trying to do, or what, what, what is your software. And for contributors, you're also giving them an idea about, is there someone who's like, like, wow, I really love this software, and I want to try to do something to make it better, because I have this idea. You need to help provide them a way, a, a stepping like a stepping stone to get to the place they need to go to contribute to a project. So in regard for users, you want to most clearly communicate what your project objectives is, are, and how to solve them. You want to make it clear why your project is the best solution for whatever you're doing. So for a smaller project, you're reading. Just make it clear, like, what is your software? What are you trying to do? What makes it effective for the purpose of, or your goals? And also, you want to include how to get involved. If you have, like, uh, easy fix tickets and other things, which I'll get to in a minute about ideas for that. Uh, but you want to communicate those. And then for larger projects, if it's like a wiki page or that's an overview of your project, like in Fedora, we have a, an overview of the Fedora project on our wiki that goes into things like what is Fedora, what is Fedora Linux, and what is our community, what, what are all the different parts of the Fedora community, and what our governance model is like, but also how to join the Fedora project, which then links you to various other resources that we have in the project community. The key thing you need to remember is you have one shot so make it count. And you need to prioritize the information you want to include, and you also need to organize it. You don't want to overwhelm them with too much information because then they'll just close the page and you've lost them. So you need to prioritize what's the most important things to include in your, in your 
your front door, your project, and make sure you organize it in a way that makes sense. So another tool that you can use is announcement mailing lists for depending on your project size. But it's understandable to worry about sending too many emails to an announcement project list. But the thing that I also see sometimes is that people are afraid to use it because like, oh, I mean, we don't want to send too many emails to the project and like, to the people who are on the list, which is understandable. But you also have to keep in mind that these people have actively made the choice to subscribe to your announcement mailing list. And they want it to be included in communication about what's happening in your project community. So it's important for you to, if the decision is like, well, if we want to announce that, we're, that we need help on this thing, or that we have this new feature coming, or some kind of key project news, you shouldn't be afraid to use an announcement mailing list in, in the fear of, of sending too many mails. Because if someone does end up unsubscribing because they say, like, ah, oh, this is too much, and I, didn't, I don't want to, to read this, then they probably weren't that engaged with your project in the first place. But if they're there, and they're following, and you're not posting, that's a missed opportunity for you to connect with people who are either active users that you could potentially interest to contribute to your community, or just engage with people who might end up telling the story of your project in other places. So there's various other platforms like this, like opensource.com, Fedora Magazine is an example too. But you shouldn't be afraid to use the announcement mailing list at all, because, or less frequently, because the people who are there want to know about your project. So you need to keep them informed and keep them connected. Include a call to action if you're going to post there. If it's something like a project news and you're looking for, need a little help with something, have a call to action. So that way people who are reading, who are kind of like on the fringe of user and contributor, have a way to engage with your project. They know, like, hey, here's a chance I can take a look at So the next one in order of frequency is writing and blogging. And this is something that I've done a fair amount uh, in Fedora. And I think for larger projects, it's really key to centralize where your contributors are writing their, their like, updates on projects. Or if it's a larger community, sometimes we use planets for people to consolidate other blog posts. Like in Fedora, we have the Fedora planet where Anyone who's a contributor can sync their blog up and then their blog post will appear on the planet. Sometimes there's really awesome posts on there that describe so many amazing things that are happening in this one part of Fedora that you would never have realized unless you read their blog post. Sometimes it's a story about how someone learned to swim over the summer and it's not really relevant to the project community. But the thing that we tried doing in Fedora around November 2015 was we introduced the Fedora community blog. And this is kind of the the idea behind it is if you want to know what's happening in the Fedora project community, you can go to the community blog and you can see what's happening in Fedora today, what's happening in Fedora this week. And you can sort by categories for all the different sub-projects, documentation, community operations, design, development, the Fedora Council, so on and so forth. And the benefit of having that is that there's no need to try to navigate through this sea of contributor blogs to figure out what's really going on in your project community. So people who are active in your project in the community can go here and see what's going on in these different parts of the community. And there are people who are users or just interested in your community. They can engage with the project by going here and seeing, like, oh, like, I was kind of interested in the design team and I want to get involved with design. What's going on here? Um, for smaller projects, so if you just have like a single Git repository or maybe it's a small handful of very active contributors, you should consolidate and promote where you're writing content. For a smaller project, you might have it in, your, in the README or the project overview about here's where we're writing posts about the project, about like the project, and you can follow here to figure out what's going on, so on and so forth. But the, th the key thing here is that it shouldn't become too much of a chore. You, you want to go short and sweet instead of going long and then you're writing a thousand words and you're like, why did I ever think this was a good idea? I don't want to write this anymore. So you need to, and it actually ends up scoring a lot better too for people who are actually reading your articles when they're shorter and more to the point. So the, in general, the importance of writing and blogging is you're trying to communicate what's happening in the project community at a larger, more broad level than you might put in an announcement mailing list. And you can write more frequently because it's not like people are really actively emailed or, or poked about it all the time. Um, so it's a really great way to kind of communicate some of these bigger ideas. Like maybe you have a milestone you're working towards and you want to do like a a monthly update, like here's where this milestone was, we've walked onto these issues, we've gotten stuck here, 
or we have these really cool things that are coming in the near future, we want to promote this better in, in the next release of the software, or so on and so forth. But the idea is that writing and blogging is a really great way to give people a better insight to some of the development behind your project and to better understand what's happening in your community. So for a larger project, it makes sense to centralize and have a single place to offer this kind of information. For a smaller project, just more clearly communicate where people can go for news or for updates specific to your project community. And lastly, the last way I kind of picked out is social media. So it's supposed to be short, sweet, and to the point. If you've been doing something this week in your project, like you work towards an issue and you have a few new comments in there, and you can fit it into 140 characters, great. Post something. So people who are engaged with you on social media accounts for your project, if you have one, can follow you that way. And it doesn't have to be something that's like, okay, I'm going to sit down and then write a tweet. You know, it's 140 characters. If you did something cool this week, put it there. So that way people can see that your project is active. And there's things happening in your project community. You don't have to try to figure out, like, how do I need to make this, that these, these really cool things that we're doing more visible. Just you do these smaller things that people who are interested can go there instead of looking like, well, I don't know if this project is really active anymore. I don't know what they're really up to. Great, they go to your social media and you can see like maybe once a week or even for a very larger project, maybe even daily. Um, but that's a really great way for people to see that your project is moving and things are happening and they can follow you on those platforms. And it's a very great way for you to engage with, again, either current contributors for a larger project who might not have an idea of what's happening in these two different sides of the project, but also people who are potentially interested in using or contributing to your software. So once you do all of these things, how do you make efforts, like how do you make a connection? Like if I've really been, all this work that I've been doing, how do I know it's paying off? Like what's the, how do we know it's actually having an impact? Uh, so I want to give a specific example of what we have in Fedora, which is this really cool thing called Fed Message. <laughs> Fed Message is kind of, it's, a, it's an event bus that emits a notification for every kind of event that happens in our project. Examples being every time there's a commit to a package repository, every time a new Koji build comes, every time a new bug is filed in Mozilla, blog posts on contributor blogs, translations, Ansible playbook runs, ticket comments, ask Fedora questions, it's, it's all on there. And it's this really cool way to kind of see like, what's happening in Fedora at this exact second. And you, in, in Freeno, there's a channel, Fedora-Fed message, which is just kind of like the spire hose of, of all these notifications all at once. And, and if you go there and you're in, the, you're in the channel, you'll sit for five minutes and you'll wonder how is any of this supposed to help me? Because it's hundreds of lines just coming, coming, coming. And you're, like, how do I read or interpret this? But the way that makes it really cool is when we more finely whittle down what we're looking at and we filter it into making connections with certain things that we're doing in the project community, and we make that comparison with data that we have in Fed Message. So a really cool example that we had for FOSM being relevant, uh, there was a really cool case study that a contributor put together about uh, our impact about Fedora at FOSM. So, the idea was we have a booth that our community stand every year, and there's a badge that people can claim too. And we were curious, like, so these people who are claiming the badges, like, do they do anything in Fedora after they get it, or like, are we doing anything there? Like, or what's our impact here? Like, are we doing anything that's uh, worth highlighting? And it's like one thing that we looked at was like, who's saying hello to us for the first time? Who are people who already have a Fedora account, and people who just signed up the weekend during positive? And uh, in this one, you can see that we have, for the most part, it was people who already had a Fedora account or who were already active contributors who were claiming the badge. But in 2014 and 2016, we also had a fair number of people who were newcomers to the Fedora project uh, find it and engage us that way. And then, so the question I don't think it's worth it for Fedora to come to Boston. It's not worth it for us to pay to, to travel, to make people travel here and to make that happen. The end result of, of the, the conclusion, one of the conclusions of the data was that one out of, or out of the 52 people who had uh, attended FOSM, 18 of 2014, 18 of them had an increase in their long-term activity after FOSM, and then they jumped up into a higher activity group in a, I think it was a six-month period that was looked at before and after FOSM. So 18 of those people started contributing more in a long-term view after FOSM, and then it was three that actually ended up decreasing. And Fed Message is a really amazing way for us to kind of better understand our project community to see what are we doing well. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it isn't exclusive to events either. 
whether it's things like trying to promote translation days, where we write a blog post on the Fedora community blog about, hey, we're doing a, 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 a translation spring, we want people to help out. We can try filtering the Fed message data we're seeing for translations in correspondence to the promotion and marketing or, or what we're doing to try to make this event more visible to a wider community. So it, it really is great that we have this. And um, there's a, the full blog post is a really awesome blog post, and I really recommend checking it out. It goes much deeper than anything I've covered here. <coughs> but, so, how do you show these results if you don't have something like Fed Message? Not everyone is so lucky to have, what, uh, have something like Fed Message. But, there's still patterns that you can use to understand your success. So, depending on what kind of resources you have in your project community, if you're trying to promote like a specific issue or you've gotten stuck on something and you're trying to engage more contributors or a wider audience, you can try to measure the commits and issues and pull requests that are coming into your repository over a certain span of time. Uh, if you have an account registration system and you're trying to promote contributing to your project, see if there's been an increase in the number of account registrations on your, on your account system for your project. Um, for conference and event engagement, kind of like the positive example, see if there's an increase in, in like the number of issues and pull requests after you, if you have a presence at an event or a conference. Um, you can also, if you have a localization effort in your project, see if there's an increase in the number of translated streams or a new language just started appearing in your project. For if you have an automatic tool like Zanata and things a few others as well. But the, the point is that even if you don't have a lot of the fancy tools, you can still cut it down to something that's very simple and is really kind of universal to any open source project. And if you look at it from a more simple way, you can try to make these conclusions on your own, regardless of what kind of resources or tools you have. But the, the way I, I think to look at it is there, there is a story in your project community. One person saw a world of wizards and, and witches and magic, and she shared that story, and she inspired billions. You have a story in your project. You need to find your story, and you need to share it. Thank you. So in that case, it would be better to look at a different data point for like maybe to say 
bug tracker or some other place where there's a significant point of activity in your project, you want to look at engagement there instead of counting the number of commits or how long the commit was. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? No more questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I hope we see you around somewhere in the event with the other thousand people.